الثاني الذي جمعنا في هذا المكان المبارك كي نتذاكر نحن إياكم سير الصالحين وسيرة سيدتي بنات العالمين ونساء العالمين فاطمة الزهراء رضي الله تعالى عنها وعليه السلام ونفعنا بها وبأبيها وبذريتها إلى يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين اللهم إني أتبرأ من حولي وقوتي وأتجئ إلى حولك وقوتك يا ذي القوة المتين اللهم إني أتبرأ من حولي وقوتي وأتجئ إلى حولك وقوتك يا ذي القوة المتين اللهم إني أتبرأ من حولي وقوتي وأتجئ إلى حولك وقوتك يا ذي القوة المتين رب إشرح لي صدري وسر لي أمري وحل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ولسانا ذاكرا شاكرا اللهم اجعل جمعنا هذا جمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما اللهم املا قلوبنا بمحبتك وبمحبة نبيك وبمحبة أهل بيتك وبصحابة رسولك صلى الله عليه وسلم ورضي الله تعالى عنهم أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى الله The topic that is at hand is an extremely important one. One, because I think it's the most important topic to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa loved no one like he loved his youngest daughter Fatima al-Zahra radiallahu ta'ala She was the youngest of his girls. But she was the most loved and he was the most fond of her. And Fatima to Zahra, as we all know, is the mother of all those who trace their lineage today back to the Ahl Bayt or the family of the Prophet. So she occupies a station and a degree within our Islamic civilization which is not occupied by any other person. The Prophet ﷺ says that there are four women that Allah Ta'ala has completed. Meaning there are four women in the history of humanity who have reached the highest degrees of perfection and completeness in their faith. Who are they? He says, Khadija bintu Khuwaylid. Khadija, the daughter of Khuwaylid. The wife of Rasulullah ﷺ. The only wife the sole wife, the unique wife, the monogamous partner of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The lady who he married at the age of 25 years, and she was 15 years his senior at the age of 40 years. And he remained married to her sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for such a long time until he reached the age of 50. For 25 years, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had only one wife. And you have people today that say, you Muslims, you go out, you marry more than one wife. This is the sunnah of your prophet. We tell them for 25 years, he only had one wife. And all the wives after Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, they were not able to reach her degree of perfection. For the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and excuse me if I skip right now, but the Prophet sallallahu at times in the company of Sayyida Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, he would mention Khadija, and when a lady would knock on the door, he would say, this resembles the knock of Khadija. And when a friend of Khadija would come, or he would see, he says, this lady resembles, or reminds me of Khadija. And Aisha would see the Prophet sallallahu whenever they would have some excess food, he would send, or he would order it for it to be sent to such and such lady. She was a friend of his wife Khadija. And so Aisha says, Ya Rasulullah, what's this business? We always hear you talking about Khadija, Khadija. Khadija's gone, where are you with you now? And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, He says, Khadija was the first to believe in me. He says, Khadija was the one that supported me with her wealth, with her wealth, with her life. She was the one that consoled me and comforted me. She was the one that accepted me when everyone else rejected me. This was Khadija. And this was the mother of the mistress, 
the lady, the leader of the ladies and the women of this life, of this world, and those of Jannah, Fatima to Zahra. So if this was this liege lady, this great woman Khadija, then what do you expect of her daughter and her daughters and of them Fatima? So the Prophet ﷺ says, four women have reached the degrees of perfection, Khadija bin Khwaylid. And he says, Asya, the wife of Fir'aun. Asya, the wife of Fir'aun. This lady who lived in the most tyrannical and oppressive palace and place and house on earth in that time. But she was a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she reached such a stage of perfection in her faith that when she makes dua to Allah, she says, Oh Allah, build for me a place or a dar, a bait with you in Jannah. So she chose her, her dwelling to be with Allah before it would be in Jannah. Because she was with Allah in this life. So to her, Jannah was secondary. secondary. And such is the motivation and the objective and the purpose of those who have been transformed by the nur and the light of Iman entering their hearts. That their only desire is Allah, Allah. They only find uns, they only find comfort in their dhikr of Allah. So such was Asya. And also of the women that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had allowed to reach perfection was Fatima to Zahra radiallahu ta'ala anha. This young girl who grew up in the household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we all know the year in which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born was Amul Fiyyah. The year of the elephant. And in this year, we know that Abraha from Yemen, he went out because he was under the, the leadership and the sultanate of Habasha, Abyssinia. He went out to challenge the Arabs and to destroy their house of worship, the Kaaba. And he goes out with his army in order to bring destruction to this house. And the story where he has this elephants and the leader of them, Mahmoud, every time he directs it to the Kaaba, it stops and sits down. But whenever he turns it left or right or back towards Yemen, it gets up and starts walking. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects the Kaaba from any destruction that year. And then he sends these birds with these pellets or these stones, one in its beak, one in its, each of its uh, legs, which then pelt these people that have come with the army of Abraha, such that as soon as one hits them, it brings him down, either he dies immediately, or on his way back to Yemen, he will slowly deteriorate and disintegrate his body, such that he arrives and he reaches back home, and there's hardly anything left of his body. This was Amul Fil, the year of the elephant, the year in which Rasulullah was born. So there was an event connected to the first house that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had established for the worship of him on earth. And the Kaaba, as we know, when Allah sends Adam alayhi salam onto earth and he orders him to build the Kaaba and he finishes building the Kaaba, the angels say to Adam, for 2,000 years before this, we've been coming and doing our tawaf around this place. And then over the years, and with the flood in the time of Sayyidina Nuh, the Kaaba falls, and then it is rebuilt over the generations and the years. In the time of Sayyidina Ibrahim, he rebuilds it with his son Ismail, according to the original structure and the boundaries, as a rectangular prism. And then over the years, again, it starts to deteriorate and is destroyed, until the people of Quraysh, they decide amongst themselves to rebuild the Kaaba. This was when the Prophet Sallallahu was about 35 years of age. About five years before, the revelation descends upon him in Ghar Hira. And so the leaders of Quraysh come together and they say, this is the house of Allah, this is God's house, so let us rebuild it, but we will rebuild it only with money that is lawful, meaning no money from usury, riba, interest, no money from selling that which is prohibited, no money that we have stolen or received through oppressive means. And so they come bring together all their wealth 
and they only find that they have enough to build the Kaaba according to the dimensions that we see today, which is the square prism cube structure, but the original dimensions of the Kaaba in the time of Sayyidina Ibrahim was that it was a rectangular prism, including that arch, that semicircle, what's called Hijr Ismail, which the Arabs of Quraysh then they put this in order to indicate that this was also part of the Kaaba. So a person that makes the wealth, when they go for Hajj, and they go for Umrah, and they say, I want to take a shortcut in my tawaf. And so they go inside this semicircle of Hajar Ismail because they find there's a gap, and they're not going to get into the crowd. We say to you, very good, you have noble intention, however, that tawaf you must repeat, and it will not be accepted, and like your Hajj will not be accepted if this is a way of tawaf, because this is inside the Kaaba, you have not gone outside the Kaaba, even though you've gone outside the physical structure, because this is not the original dimensions of the Kaaba. So, in the year 5 before Revelation, the Quraysh come together and they rebuild, and they arrive to the point of the black stone. They don't know what to do. Each one of the chiefs of the tribe, he wants to be the one that puts the black stone in, to the point where they're going to go get their swords, and they're going to go kill one another, as the Arabs do, even till today. They haven't changed. And so... They decide amongst themselves, look, there's no point in doing this. What are we going to do? We have to come to some type of solution. All right. They say, let us submit our rule to the first one that enters the gates of the Haram of Allah. Let him solve the problem. You agree? We all agree? Okay. And so they find the first to enter the sacred precinct of Allah is as sadiq al-Ameen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they tell him our story, their, uh, their, their problem. And just like George Bernard Shaw in the beginning of the 20th century, he says, if Muhammad were to be around today, he would solve all the world's problems over a cup of tea. He solved the world's problems in that time as he entered the Masjid al-Haram, such that the tribes of the Arab people would not go and war against one another. Otherwise, if he, let, if, the, if, if he didn't come, then they would have been in war, in war, and God knows what would have occurred later on. So he comes, and... He takes his shawl and he lays it down and he says, place the black stone in the shawl. And he says to each one of the chiefs of the various clans of Quraysh, hold this corner, hold this corner, hold this corner, hold this corner, hold this. So they're all holding and he says, raise the cloth. So they raise the cloth in the middle of the cloth is the black stone until they reach the point in the rukun, in the corner of the Kaaba, which is aligned to where the black stone's position is. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, five years before revelation from Allah, he takes with his blessed hand and he holds the black stone, which was a precious stone and gem that Allah ta'ala had descended from paradise, which was pure white. However, because of the sins of the descendants of Adam, it darkened and became black. And it will witness for every person that touches it, every person that kisses it, every person that points his finger or his staff or looks at it, during his tawaf, that they are believers, that they have come, they have kissed me, and they have visited me, witness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yawm al-qiyamah. And so for those people that say inanimate objects do not benefit, then we say this object is a rock which Allah ta'ala sent down from Jannah, and it benefits because Allah has put benefit in there. And say, no, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he says, were it not for me seeing Rasulullah kissing you, I would not have kissed you. Meaning that there is benefit, in this particular stone. And so Rasulullah takes with his blessed hand and he raises the black stone and he places it in his new position and by this simple gesture of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, all the chiefs and the tribes and the shuyukh and the ru'asa of Quraysh are happy with the decision of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It is in these days and in these nights that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam returns back to his home to a home in which she had been married to Khadija for some 10 years. And she had already had three daughters. She had had Zainab, she had had Ruqayya, and she had Umm Kulthum. These three daughters were the first of the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And upon his return home, he finds that his wife, Khadija al-Kubra, the great, has given birth. However, Khadija and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all this before revelation, he gives her congratulations, alhamdulillah, whoa, whoa, excellent, wonderful, uh, you're all safe, you're healthy, everything gone okay. 
but she stares at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The stare of a person who is feeling sorry and perhaps unable to deliver to the most beloved of people to her that which she thinks he wants. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the compassionate, loving and understanding man that he says, he doesn't say, oh, it's not a boy, why, we want boys. No, he says, this is what God has decreed. God gives, and perhaps there will be great blessing in this particular girl, and he makes dua for her and uh, for her family and progeny. And with that, Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha takes Fatima to Zahra. In her early years, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa names her Fatima, and he gives her the nickname of a Zahra. And she continues to play in her household and family with her three elder sisters. And whenever her mother looks at her, as she is playing with her three siblings, she is extremely joyful and happy at the comfort of her youngest daughter Fatima. Until a time comes when her sisters all reach the age of marriage. Zainab, Al-Qayya, and al Qayyah. And so Fatima to Zahra is left alone. During those years, she would be one that would not go out and play much with the girls and the children on the streets because she was someone who was attached dearly uh, to both her mother and her father. And so, after the rest of her sisters had left the home, and she becomes so attached to them as well, she comes to her mother, Khadija, weeping, tears coming down her cheeks. And her mother asks her, Why are you crying? And this is a lesson for us parents in Tarbiyah. If you see sadness in your children, in your daughter, in your son, signs, indications, then you should inquire. In fact, you should have such a good relationship with them that they will be able to open up to you. But the problem today is most of our parents are busy either with work or with something else or with their dunya or they are so harsh that they find no compassion, no love. And so we find our children are going to other people and they're confiding in other people, the enemies of Allah, those people who are stripping them of all akhlaq, of all modesty, of all good manners. But Fatima finds it in herself the courage to come to her mother, weeping. And so her mother says to her, Fatima, what is it that brings you to this state of weeping? And she says, she says, I can't bear to leave you and my father. Like my sister's left, I don't think I can do such. And so her mother consoles her and comforts her. She says, oh Fatima, she says, you will only leave if you wish to leave. Meaning, if you only, only if you wish to marry, then you'll marry. We can't force you. And so she comforts her. And this young girl, at this tender age, so sensitive, so fragile in the prophetic household, these are the words that she hears from her mother. And as she grows up in this household, she spends the times of solitude with her father, with her mother, where there's no one else. And she witnesses how her mother supports her father. How her mother goes out to sacrifice her own time and her own wealth for her father. But where in our households today do we see mothers going out and doing everything that they can in support of the father of the children? Where is it that we see harmony between mother and father, husband and wife, particularly in front of our children? The worst thing that can happen in a family is that mum and dad are witnessed by the children in argumentation and conflict. But in the household of Rasulullah Fatima to Zahra, in her younger years, all she witnesses is compassion and mercy and sacrifice. And so she sees that her mother, from time to time, will pack some bags, put some food, some dates, some water, and she will send it with Rasulullah all before revelation in order for him to climb the Mount of Light, in, to, in order to enter Ghar Hira, the cave of Hira, where he would go out and do his own solitude and worship and retreat, was called Tahannuf, which was the type of worship that the believers who were still on the religion of their 
great grandfather Ibrahim السلام, is, was still president of these people, was Khadija, and of these people were the likes of uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and other individuals of the Arabs within Quraysh, even though the majority of them had diverted from that pure way, the way of what's called the uh, the the Deen al Hunafa or the way of the Hunafa, and the Hunafa are those who divert away from that which is false. And so he would go, but Khadija would send her servant to follow the Prophet sallallahu from a distance and ensure that he arrived at his destination at Ghar Iraq safely and then she would tell him once he arrives and you're sure that he's there then come back and report back to me that everything is okay this was the love that was between the mother of Fatima and the father of Fatima this is the love that the mothers and the fathers of our Muslim children today need to show their children our problem today is we do not show the love and the affection between husband and wife in front of our children in order for the child to grow up knowing that they're living in a stable family. But how many families today break up in conflict, break up in divorce? If we were to look at the statistics, particularly in Western countries, and also Muslim countries, the percentage of marriages that end up in divorce, it is something that is phenomenal. Why? Because we want to live a Hollywood marriage. We want to live romance, Romeo and Juliet. This is all fake, this is all fantasy. There is no marriage without struggle, without sacrifice. Everyone wants his wife to be Miss, what do you call, Universe, and she wants his, her husband to be Mr. Universe. No such thing. It is the beauty on the inside that is going to manifest on the outside. But if you go and you look for someone that is so pretty and beautiful on the outside, count 30 years and you won't be able to stand looking at them before. Uh, again, why? Because they're all wrinkled and they've got osteoporosis and they're about to fall over and they're going to retire in the village. Uh, why? Because this is what you wanted. You're attracted to it once it's gone. You look to something else, such as most people in this dunya. But if you're attracted to what's inside, principles, ethics, akhlaq, then this is always going to be there, and it's only going to increase and strengthen, and then you'll see, even if she's the ugliest person on earth, you'll see her, mashallah, she's princess, she's queen. Why? Because the inner has an effect on the outer. And so the servant would come back and report back to Khadija, and the Prophet sallallahu chose this particular place of Ghar Hira, for a number of reasons, and of these is that from the opening in the cave of Hira, he could see the Kaaba, and to the Prophet وسلم, gazing upon the holy house of Allah, even before prophecy was a ibadah for him. Allah Ta'ala had guided him to it, just like it was a ibadah, as Allah Ta'ala descends 120 parts of mercy onto those that are surrounding the Kaaba, 60 parts of those mercy for those doing tawaf. 40 parts of that mercy for those in Salah and 20 parts of the mercy for those simply watching, laying their eyes on Kaaba. Even if you're in Hilton, even if you're in what do you call uh, Marwa Rayhan, Rotana Hotel in the towers and you're looking from your $5,000 a night uh, hotel window, this, this size, you're looking at half view of Kaaba. <coughs> you're looking at Kaaba? This is Ayba. This is worship. And the Prophet وسلم, says in some athar that a person's gazing upon his parents' faces with the eye of magnification and reverence equals the reward of the Hajj. So look to this. How Islam comes to establish the principles of family relations and relationships within our religion. So he could wait, gaze upon the Kaaba from Ghar Hira. In addition to that, it was outside the city of Mecca. So he was able to focus and concentrate on his ibadah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, teaching us that a person needs to take from time to time, time out, khadwa, retreat, seclusion, to protect society from your evil. His first intention. Because most people, when they go for i'tikaf, in the masjid, or they go for khalwa, they say, I've had enough of this society, they're all liars, they're all back, what they call backstabbers, they're all traitors, they're all cheaters, they're all kuffar, they're all stuff for Allah, and they're all, yeah, 
And mashallah, you got wahi coming down on you. Revelation comes down upon you, mashallah. You're full of light. You're perfect. They're probably saying the same thing about you when they go for Atikaf. So your first intention, Imam Ghazali says, is as you go to Atikaf. He says, if you go to Atikaf here, well, you may as well not go to Atikaf because you're, first of all, you're sinful in your Atikaf. Why? Because you're going in with the, the aqid of Iblis, and I'm better than him, I'm better than anyone else. Oh, hold your horses now. He says, protect society from your evil first. This would be your first intention. And so, this was the way of the Prophet wasallam. And Fatima the Zahra was there to witness Rasulullah wasallam coming back from Ghar Kira with the Wahi, and he coming back to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, and he says, Zamminuni, Zamminuni, cover me, cover me. The Prophet wasallam shaking, not knowing what happened to him. This was something that was strange. He would go in ibadah, and worship, and reflection upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and his creation. And this particular time, he tells the story that there was this something, this being, that came and held him and embraced him extremely tightly from behind, saying to him, recite. He says, I can't, I'm not one to recite. I don't know how to read. He says to him, recite. He says, I'm not one to read. He says, recite in the name of your Lord who created, created the human being from a clot of blood. To the end of the ayat of the first of Surah Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Allahi Khalaq, Khalaq al-Insan min Alaq, Iqra, recite and read. Indeed, your Lord is most noble and honorable. He is the one that taught the human being by the pen. Meaning, it is not you that teaches yourself. It is not you that goes out and acquires knowledge and becomes educated, university, college, whatever it may be. But it is Allah that casts knowledge in your heart and in your mind. And with that, he comes back running to Khadija, cutting his ertikar short, complaining to her, and she sees that he is shaking, and he is scared, and he is fearful, and so she covers him, because he's shivering, and then she consoles him as she would console. She was, you see, Khadija was more than a wife for Rasulullah Sallallahu She was a loving mother, she was a supporter, she was social security for him. Some people come to Denmark now because they give out handouts. Khadija was before Denmark gave out handouts, she gave out handouts the best of preachers, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She supported him with her wealth, with everything that she had. And she says, oh Muhammad, she says, surely Allah, and this is a sign that she was a believer, surely Allah will not uh, humiliate you. Surely Allah will not leave you to evil spirits. In fact, you are the one that helps the poor and the needy. You are the one that goes and assists the people that ask for intercession. You are the one that clothes people that don't have clothes. You are the one that goes and removes oppression where there is. You, anyone that is in need, you are there to help them. Allah is not going to leave you alone on this one. And so she brings him comfort and then she takes him to her cousin, Waraka, the son of Nawfal, who was a man who was well versed in previous revelations and dispensations. And he says, in fact, this is the namus that came down upon Isa. This is the spirit that came down upon Jesus and upon Moses, referring to Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam. And he says, if I were to be alive in your time, then I would go out and support you. For verily, the Jews will go out and they will bring and they will they will, they will cause uh, oppression and trying to, to remove you uh, from your place. Uh, and so, Fatima the Zara witnesses these early years of revelation. And at that, Khadija calls upon her three other daughters, Zainab and Muqayya and Umm Kulthum, in these early days of revelation, and she presents to them the situation. She says, your father has had revelation descend upon him for us to believe in Allah in the last day. You ready? They say, we're ready. And they believe. And Fatima the Zara believes. And they're first of the household that believe. So they say the first of the women that believed was Khadija. The first of the boys that believed was Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib because he grew up in the household of the Prophet sallallahu And the first of the men that believed was Abu Bakr. Uh, and the first of the slaves that believed was Sayyidina Zaid, who was with uh, Sayyidina Khadija at that time. And so, such were the early years of revelation. And then, as the time passed, and the Prophet sallallahu would gradually increase his reach in the da'wah to Allah, such that he would go out and meet the various tribes and chiefs of Quraysh and surrounding Arab tribes, 
offering them, inviting them to the deen of Allah, they would respond to him. How? With harshness, with coarseness, with insults, with harm, with persecution. But Fatima to Zahra would be right behind her father, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he was at home, she would be at home. And when he was out in the da'wah, she would be behind him in the da'wah. So, our call today, where are our daughters? Where are our sons? We're busy going out and teaching and doing good things and in our da'wah, in our khidmah, our wonderful work. Where are our children? Do we report back to our children what we are doing? Do we allow our children to share in our lives? Do we allow them to enter and we invite them into our experiences that we're experiencing with the world around us in order for them to be prepared for the great future that lies before them. And so Fatima the Zahra was prepared at a young age in the companionship of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so there will be one time when she finds the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes out and she follows him. And then a group of Quraysh, they start to approach Rasulullah and they encircle him, they surround him. And they say, you, Muhammad, ah, you're the one that insults our idols. You're the one that wants us to leave the worship of our idols for some god, for your god. He says, yes, I'm the one. And at that, they start swearing at Rasulullah. They start insulting Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this Fatima the Zahra is watching. Imagine what it would do to some young child that is watching this, that is happening to her most beloved father. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala comes, and he says, what are you doing? This is a man that is saying, I believe in Allah, Rabbi Allah, my Lord is God. What have you uh, to come and to persecute him and to insult him? And so they pull Abu Bakr back and they go and they, a man comes and he pulls the, the uh, what do you call, the, the, the upper shawl or the upper garment, the shirt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all these Fatima al Zara is watching and they come and they hit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, blood starts to shed and to flow, and he ends up walking back to his house, to his home. And Fatima, and they bring dust and dirt, and they throw it onto the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All this in the early years of the da'wah. So the difficulty that we experience in our lands, of perhaps insults of certain politicians, perhaps certain acts of racism, certain coarse words. This is nothing compared to the harm that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa experienced for us in his early years. And so he goes back home and Fatima to Zahra weeping and crying for her father. Because when she sees that this is happening to her father, at the beginning she starts responding to the insults of the kuffar of Quraysh. But then it gets to a point where she just loses her speech. She cannot speak anymore and that's when Abu Bakr came in order to intercede, to no avail. And so upon returning home, Sayyidah Fatima comes to the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she dusts that dirt off the blessed face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that same face that many years later would be invited to witness the beauty and the majesty of his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala during the Isra and the Mi'raj. That particular face that when it goes down in sujood before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to it, raise and ask and you will be granted your request and intercede and your intercession will be granted. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will ask Allah for the hisab, the account to begin. And the next life will then take its next stage and then people's good deeds and bad deeds and scrolls of actions will be brought before them for the akhirah to continue in its course of future events. And so she dusts the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she gets some water and she wipes it over him. But he comforts her, saying to her, O Fatima, your Lord is not going to leave me. Meaning Allah will protect your father, don't you worry. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reassured her. And so how important it is when we live in such difficult times as Muslims, that we reassure our families, we reassure our children that Allah will not leave us. Hasbi Allah wa ni'ma al wakil When Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam was cast into the fire of the king of his time after they had gone and they brought it for so many days and so many months such it can be raging fire. Why? 
Because he wanted to bring people away from the worship of their idols to the worship of Allah. So they say, how? This man, he's trying to take us away from the worship of our idols, so they throw him into the fire. So what does Allah do? He says, Kuni bardan wa salaman. He says, be coolness, be peace, be safety for Ibrahim. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he's asked, how are the days when you were in the fire? He says, they were the best days of my life. Why Ibrahim? He says, because my food and drink that comes to me on a silver platter, I don't have to do anything. I'm there, no problem. So for them, they thought that he was being burnt. But for this man of Allah, who was connected to Allah, Allah brought everything that he needed there. And when Jibreel comes to him, he says, Ibrahim, do you have anything, anything that you want to ask of me or of Allah? He says to him, he says, he says, oh Jibreel, he says, he says, عِلْمُهُ بِحَالِ يُغْنِ عَنْ سُؤَالِ His knowledge of my state is enough. I don't need to ask him. He says, Jibreel, he says, I already said, حَسْبِ اللَّهُ وَنَعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ He says, I already said, Allah is enough for me. He is the best of patrons and custodians. You want me now to ask you? A creature of Allah. I already said, Allah is enough for me. This is true iman. This is the iman that we need when we're living in troubled times. And this is the iman that is passed from Prophet to Prophet and from Prophet to his progeny through Fatima to Zahra to the Ahlul Bayt and the descendants of Fatima to Zahra that we have today, which will mention some of their virtues a little later on in the presentation. And so, the Prophet ﷺ reassures her that Allah will not leave him. And such the da'wah continues and continues to spread to the point where Fatima to Zahra radiallahu ta'ala anha. As they approach the time in which Allah gives permission for the Muslims and commands them to do the hijrah, the migration, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Mecca to Medina, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, إِنَّمَا الْأَحْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are by intention. He says, he says, he whose migrations, uh, he whose migration is for Allah and His Messenger, his migration is for Allah and His Messenger. But the one who migrates for dunya, business, the one who migrates for a lady, he wants to, he's already engaged to her and he wants to marry her, like one of the particular Sahaba, he was engaged to a lady, she made migration from Mecca to Medina. So he wanted to go to Medina, why? To be with Rasulullah? Because to get married to his beautiful, uh, what do you call, Juliet, his, his uh, lady. And so they called him the migrant of such and such lady, the immigrant of such and such lady, not the, the immigrant to Allah and his messenger. So we're reminded of the importance of our intentions, even though our outward action can take a particular form which resembles the outward action of another person, but how far they are in closeness to Allah, one's in the east and one's in the west, one is accepted and one is rejected totally. And so, at the innocent age of 18 years, Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, or thereabouts, uh, before, this is the age in which she was closer to, uh, closer to marriage. Before this age, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in his migration, goes out to Mecca, and goes out to Medina from Mecca. However, he has Fatima al Zahra back in Mecca. And so, he sends for her to come, after he arrives into Medina, and she comes and follows him in the Hijrah, in the migration. And as they're settling there, obviously, in the state of Medina, uh, there is no, not much thought regarding uh, uh, her marriage. And so, there's uh, no uh, bachelors that introduce themselves to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi marriage in the early years. Why? Because they're all busy with the Dawah and the establishment of the Islamic State and going out propagating the message. But what we missed was before that, in the difficult times of Mecca, when they, the chiefs of the Quraysh of, of Mecca, they decided to uh, enter a boycott against the Muslims. Like today, Muslims enter boycotts against Israeli products, <laughs> the, uh, the Mushrikun, the polytheists, decided amongst themselves that we are not going to sell anything to the Muslims. We are not going to buy anything from the Muslims. We are not going to give them any of our daughters in marriage, nor are we going to marry any of their daughters. And they were uh, trapped, or they were uh, left in what's called the Shi'ab of Abi Talib, this canyon, this area of Abi Talib, where they would remain for some two years with only the leaves of the trees and whatever they have of vegetation there uh, to have access to. And within these two years, 
Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, falls ill because of the lack of uh, access to proper food and services. And likewise, Fatima does lose some of her energy and her health. So by the end of the two years, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha is escorted out of this canyon of Abi Talib back to her home. However, she needs both her daughters, one of them Fatima the Zahra, such that she, she, she can lean on her shoulder and the shoulder of her other daughter, such that she is uh, dragged out of the canyon. Uh, and from there, her health only deteriorates and she ends up passing on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, leaving the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time without his most beloved supporter and companion and wife in the form of Khadija al Kubra bin Khuwaylid. And so this is an extremely difficult time for Fatima al Zahra, her mother, her companion, her guide, her example, the one she loves so much, is no longer with her. And so she steps up in her role in the household and she assumes the role of her mother. And so she supports the Prophet in her house, she prepares the house for him, she supports him outside, she does everything and tries to do everything that her mother would have done for Rasulullah and she earns the nickname uh, by Rasulullah Umm Abiha. She is the mother of her father. And no one earned this title other than Fatima to Zahra because of this closeness that she had to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those early years when she used to witness the persecution of her father and the harm which she used to undergo, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says regarding her, he says, Fatima tu bid'atun minni. Or he says, Fatima tu qit'atun minni. He says, Fatima is a part of me. What does a part of me mean? I mean, if you take an organ of yours, this is a part of you. Even if you take it outside your body, it's still a part of you. So he says, Fatima is a part of me. He says, what makes her happy makes me happy. He says, what angers her, what upsets her, also upsets me and angers me. And so, in this advice, the Prophet ﷺ establishes, beyond any shadow of a doubt, the station and the degree of this youngest daughter of Rasulullah ﷺ. That if anyone wants to reach any closeness or nearness to Habib, the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa then it is through her and through her descendants. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says in one of his khutbas later on, he says, uh, towards the end of his, his message, he says, I shall leave amongst you two things, which if you were to hold onto tightly, you will never be misguided after me. He says, the book of Allah wa itrati, he says, the book of Allah and my progeny, the people of my household. And these we'll talk about, inshallah, after the marriage of Sayyidah Fatima. And so, in those early years, if we fast forward back to Medina, in those early years of Medina, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, the friend of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he who was the companion of Rasulullah during the Hijrah, he was Thaliath Nain, as Allah Ta'ala says. He was the second of the two in the ghar, in the cave of Thaw, where he was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi on his way to Medina in the Hijrah. And he tells the Prophet before he enters the cave, he says, Wait out here, O Rasulullah. And he goes into the cave and he dusts it and he moves anything of creatures which may be at risk to the health and the safety of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he prepares it in order for Rasulullah to enter. And so this man Abu Bakr, he feels that he wants to come closer to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he feels what an honor it would be if I were to be related to him. So he has the thought to come to Rasulullah and ask him for his daughter Fatima in marriage. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when his best friend Abu Bakr approaches him, asking for his daughter, he says, wait, there will be a command that will come. <coughs> and so he goes away, and Abu Bakr tells Umar, and Umar says, ah, you will prevent it. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala, he says to himself, I'm going to go, and I'm going to try my luck. And so he goes, and he asks the same of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for his daughter in marriage. 
until the Prophet ﷺ responds in the same way that he responded to Abu Bakr. He says, wait, he says, there will be a command that shall come. And so, it wasn't the command of Allah that Fatima be the wife of Abu Bakr nor of Umar. But rather there were some people of the Ansar who spoke to Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib and suggested that he offer himself in marriage to the daughter of Rasulullah So he comes one day to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, expressing his interest in his daughter. And so the Prophet وسلم, he gives him the green light and permission but he doesn't say anything. All he says to him, he says, he says, Ahlan wa marhaban. He says, Ahlan, my family, literal translation, and marhaban, welcome. And he goes away. And then the Ansar are waiting, and they say, what did he say to you? He says, all he said to them was, Ahlan wa marhaban. They say, oh, wonderful. He's given you his family, and he's welcomed you. So this was the answer that they were all waiting for. And so the next day, Sayyidina Ali returns to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to try and push push the, uh, the demand, the requests, like people nowadays. They'll go once to the house of the, uh, of, the, of the lady that they're after, and then they'll go the second time, the third time. They're not getting any response. They'll call, the mother will call, the father will call from here and there, and third parties and so on, waiting for a response. So Sayyidina Ali, also, he was king. And so he goes, and then the Prophet says to him, he says to him, he says to him, oh, Ali. He says, do you own anything? Do you have anything to give her in Mahar, dowry? He says, I got nothing else all along. I want nothing. Rasulullah says, Sati. He says, what about that shield that I gave you on such and such day? The shield that you used. You had both. He says, oh yes, 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 I still got that one. He says, okay, go bring it. So Sayyidina Ali goes and he brings the shield to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan hears that Sayyidina Ali has this shield, uh, ready to prepare some dowry and gift for his uh, his uh, fiancée, Sayyidina Uthman purchases the shield from Sayyidina Ali for 470 dirhams, 470 silver coins, pure silver coins. Imagine how much that would be worth. And so the Prophet Sallallahu takes a portion of that money and he buys some beautiful perfume, beautiful fragrance for, for his, uh, his daughter. And he uh, purchases uh, some other things required for the household and for his, uh, for his daughter. And then he gives the money to uh, uh, another one of his wives in order to go out and start to prepare uh, what she needs to prepare her, his daughter uh, in ready for marriage. And so she goes out and prepares whatever needs to be prepared, prepared for her. Uh, and so uh, maybe some months, some months later, this was it, this would have been in the, uh, in the first year of Hijrah, towards the end of the first year. So it was in Rajab that the Prophet ﷺ was approached by Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib in Rajab, within the first year of the Hijrah. So we have Rajab, Sha'ban, Ramadan, uh, Shawwal, Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, and then in Muharram, some seven months later, in the second year, beginning of the second year of the Hijrah, Sayyidina Ali has prepared his house. Six months, seven months, he's prepared his house, ready to move in and everything. How long are our, uh, what do you call, periods where the people go out and prepare house and furniture and lounge suites and bedroom suites and this and that and car and everything. But the preparation of Sayyidina Ali and Abi Talib was extremely simple, very simple furniture, very simple bedding, everything so simple. And even the, the, uh, the wedding gown that uh, Sayyidina Fatima al Zahra entered upon Sayyidina Ali and Abi Talib, if any one of you were to see such a wedding gown, you may think that this is not even suitable for paupers, for poor people, because of the way it looks. But this was the wedding gown of the best of the ladies and the women of this world and of Jannah. And this is what Rasulullah was content with for her. And so for all those ladies that are looking to be the next brides with their beautiful uh, gowns and uh, white uh, stunning dresses, worth uh, $5,000 to hire for one night, then I ask you and I urge you to think again. Ensure that your priorities are in the right place, that your wedding, that your marriage is according to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa without gaining big debts on your credit cards and from your parents and from this person you have to work for five years to pay for the debt that you incurred for your wedding. But allowed to be a simple wedding like the wedding of Fatima al-Zahra. And so 
she, after, after the Prophet sallallahu sent them praise for Isha on one of the nights in Muharram and Fatima the Zara has gone to the house of Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib and escorted there the Prophet sallallahu whilst both his uh, daughter Fatima and Sayyidina Ali, his cousin his new uh, son-in-law are there in the house he says to Ali go get me some water so Ali gets him some water in a vessel and the Prophet sallallahu does his magic over it he does his adhkar and his Qur'an indicating to us that there is an effect with the Qur'an and the dhikr when you recite it on something so if you recite some dhikr on water, some Qur'an, or some dua and then you consume this water or you do something with this water or you wipe yourself with this water then there is some benefit in this so it actually transforms the chemical construct of the water such that anything that touches it, it is also transformed. And so the Prophet ﷺ recited his azkar, recited his Qur'an and verses on this particular water. And then he, uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, he takes this water and he sprinkles it, sprinkles it on uh, Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Fatima. He tells them to drink from it as well. They drink from it. And then the Prophet ﷺ takes the rest of the water and he makes wudu from that water, and then from that wudu he also wipes with that water on both Ali and Fatima. And that was the introduction of Rasulullah into the first night of marriage of uh, Sayyidina Fatima and Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. And, if, and he then he makes dua for both of them, he says, Barakallahu lakuma wa baraka alaykuma. He says, May Allah bless the both of you and bring barakah and blessing between you. Uh, and he also makes dua again for their descendants and their children. So imagine if this is the start of a person's married life, that they are in the presence of Rasulullah with dhikr and with Quran. If we fast forward 1,440 years, 50 years, I don't know. How is the first night of marriage in our Muslim weddings? What goes on on the first night of marriage in our Muslim weddings? The Prophet ﷺ had prayed at Isha in Jama'ah and then come to the household of his daughter. What are the things that are recited? What are the places that are visited during that first night of marriage? Are people in love with Rasulullah? Are they reciting his sunnah, reflecting on his hadith, trying to plan and intend how can we make this marriage? according to the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so this was the beginning of the marriage, married life of Sayyidina Fatima al Zahra. And inshallah we're going to have to take a break now. And then part two will be after we finish from the break and we will continue with her life and what happened and some various gifts that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave her. And then we will uh, go through the last days and moments of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how Fatima was by his side and how she followed him shortly to the next one.